Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, the pack is back. Reintroducing wolves to Colorado. Presented by wildlife biologist, Aaron Bott. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Take it away, Aaron. Thank you, and thanks everyone for having me today. Um, this is an exciting and a current topic that hopefully we will all be able to learn a little bit from one another as we proceed and discuss what's going on in the world of conservation today, specifically in the world of wolf conservation. Um, this is a great photograph taken by Colorado Parks and Wildlife's Outreach Department. Um, of the release of one of the 10 wolves recently relocated to the state of Colorado in the last weeks of December. Um, this is a, again, a very exciting event and it's generated a lot of excitement and uh, really captivated the imagination and attention of people worldwide. And today my objective is to talk a little bit about what exactly happened and how we got here and where we're going from here. So this is hopefully gonna be an informative presentation and it's going to cover what really is going on in the field and hopefully answer some very common questions that I get asked a lot. So I'll, I hope that we'll be able to, again, benefit from this presentation mutually, not only as I deliver this, but as we get into the question and answers uh, section at the end of this presentation. Um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So as I was introduced, my name is Aaron Bott, and I am a wolf, a wolf biologist, actually, a, a government wolf biologist and a doctoral candidate at Utah State University, where I research wolves all across the American West. Um, I had the opportunity to help participate in the Colorado reintroduction process, um, a very small role among many great uh, Herculean efforts put on by biologists from all across the West. Um, it's a very exciting time, as I've mentioned, but I want to state today that I am just a presenter and everything that I have to share with you uh, does not reflect any agency or government that I am employed by or work for or are affiliated with. So uh, hopefully this is just going to be a, a great conversation that we can have and I can really just give a play-by-play -play as to what wolf ecology and biology looks like in the modern West in which some of us live and some of us just might be interested in. Um, but yeah, my responsibilities are to monitor and capture and process and research wolves again across the American West. And I've also worked with a number of other species, but mostly large carnivores, including grizzly bears and black bears and even mountain lions. To start out, I have found in my career that it's dangerous to assume that my audience knows anything about wolves. Wolves have such a tremendous reputation that sometimes uh, we find as we start to talk about wolves that people have been misinformed about their basic biology and what they are and what they are not. And this goes for pro-wolf advocates as well as anti-wolf advocates. And so I'm going to give a very brief overview of wolf biology and ecology, but if you're more interested in the dynamics of wolf social behavior or their biology and life histories, I will just direct you to Natural Habitat Adventures webinar series. I've given multiple webinars on wolf biology there. Um, wolves, Canis lupus, have had the greatest terrestrial distribution of any species on the planet with the exception of humans. And uh, it's no wonder that people have such big feelings about wolves because essentially everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere at one point in time, humans engaged with and interacted with wolves. And because of our long coexistence, we have many fairy tales and myths and stories, and again, a lot of social baggage that we place upon this animal. And so people, again, have very strong feelings either for or against the wolf. 
And I find this remarkable because today, most people never encounter a wolf, at least not in the wild. And uh, nevertheless, people still have big feelings and big emotions about it. But I'll point your direction towards my map that I have here over in the North American region. You can see that Canis lupus had a tremendous distribution across the North American continent. And Colorado fits well within the sphere of their historical range. They're commonly called gray wolves, but they come in a variety of colors. Um, often they're described as being rusty or cinnamon colored. Um, they can be white in color. They can be black in color as well. Uh, but most commonly we find them across the northern hemisphere in this kind of tonal gray color, which is why they have that name gray wolf um, so often applied to them. But again, Canis lupus is the species and the genus. And because they are so adaptive and so flexible in their behavior, um, they have lived basically everywhere from the Arctic down through the deserts. Um, they are very flexible with their behavior, which is very beneficial to them as a species. Um, they are what we call generalists. Um, conversely, there are species that are specialists, which have to have a certain type of food or a certain type of habitat in order to survive. But wolves, um, they, they can live off of just about anything and live just about anywhere. Again, that's very advantageous for their own conservation. Um, their lifespan is generally two to five years, which surprises people because they can live up to 12 years, just like a big dog can. Uh, but being a wolf is difficult. Their biology, their morphology, and physiology do not uh, benefit them when it comes to bringing down large and dangerous prey like elk or bison or moose. Um, they have to chase their prey down and catch them with their teeth, and it's easy for them to be injured during these hunts, um, which can lead to their death. Uh, also, wolves are highly territorial. They often will kill rivaling wolf packs. And so if it's not people killing wolves, then it's usually wolves killing wolves or the prey of the wolves killing wolves while they're out hunting. And then of course, people kill wolves too, um, which adds to the complexity and mess of the dynamics that we have in our relationship with wolves. On average, the wolf is about 100 pounds. Males are larger than females. We get stories often of ginormous wolves, but even in the high Arctic and boreal forests, wolves generally don't tip the scales over 110, 120 pounds. Um, again, females are smaller, and depending on where they live, uh, based off of their latitude and their environment, wolves kind of adapt to their current ecosystem in which they live. and so. Uh, as you move further south, the wolves tend to be a little bit smaller, or even further east, they tend to be a little bit smaller, but on average about 100 pounds. Wolves live in family groups known as packs. Uh, that I think most people understand. Uh, some people do think that wolves live in mobs or in gangs, uh, but a pack is essentially, in its simplest form, a family unit where you have an established breeding pair and then several age groups of offspring. They reproduce once a year in February, and uh, then they typically whelp in the middle of April. Again, that can vary slightly depending on the latitude, um, but in the springtime generally is when they'll whelp and they'll have their, their pups. And then the standard rate of maturation and ultimately dispersal is usually around the age of sexual maturity, which is about 22 months. So just before they turn uh, two years old, uh, wolves will often leave their family pack where they were born and raised, and they go off in search of a mate. This can happen earlier or later in their life, but most commonly it happens just before they turn two. So that's kind of the natural history and life cycle of a wolf, but very quickly, but I, do have to also bring to our attention that wolves are carnivorous predators. They have to kill and eat other animals in order to survive. Now, this seems like an obvious statement, but I think it's important for us to emphasize this again here because it's this fact 
that makes wolves so controversial. Um, humans have uh, value systems and some people value elk and moose and deer more than they value carnivores and some people value uh, livestock and their own property more than they value uh, wolves in which case there are conflicts and value conflicts are always an ugly thing um, but again I, I often joke about and point out that if wolves ate daisies uh, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have had these controversies and we wouldn't be having reintroductions and we wouldn't be having these um, hard but very important discussions about how we can coexist with large carnivores. Um, so again, remember that the reason why people have a hard time with wolves is because of their biology and how they have evolved to consume meat, which uh, can conflict with our own interests. Because of these conflicts, people have had a long and turbulent history with large carnivores, not just wolves, but because wolves have such a tremendous historical distribution, obviously wolves are one of the carnivores that are targeted a lot by people for lethal removal. Um, if you're in America, and today we're talking about Colorado, we focus a lot on this kind of wild western American cowboy story of people going out and shooting grizzly bears and mountain lions and wolves. But I wanna make it clear that this is a complex dynamic relationship that has been around with all peoples all over the world for millennia. Um, humans have co-evolved with large carnivores and indigenous peoples all over the world have had conflicts with large carnivores as well as figured out how to coexist with them in some places. Um, so this story is very challenging and has been challenging for a long time. However, today we are going to be talking about uh, the United States and its history with carnivore management and eradication and reintroduction. So I'll kind of spend a lot more breath talking about uh, the local history that we have out here. As Euro-Americans began to colonize and expand their way westward across the North American continent, uh, they brought with them their livestock. And they worked hard to eradicate things that they felt like would threaten their sense of security and their economic foundation. Uh, my family settled in the American West in the 1840s in the Rocky Mountains, and uh, no doubt they participated in some of this very ignorant behavior in uh, removing native prey and native carnivores from the landscape. Um, I like to point out that this is not a time where people were maliciously or, or um, behaving evilly towards, excuse me, behaving evil uh, towards the natural environment in many cases. It was just a profound sense of ignorance and a misunderstanding of ecology and the environment at large. Um, obviously now we recognize that to remove native animals from the landscape it disrupts the ecosystem and breaks down uh, the system that keeps ultimately everything functioning in the natural world. Um, but at this point in time, people were removing the bison herds, they were eradicating the deer and the elk species uh, to make way for their cows and their sheep. And then after supplanting all of the native prey with domestic livestock, we had a lot of carnivores that were killing livestock because all the native prey had been eradicated and depredation rates were extremely high at the end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s. And so governments, local and large, focused on eradicating predators like the wolf. And by the 1950s, they had succeeded. Um, there were essentially no wolves in the contiguous United States, except for a small group of wolves in northern Minnesota on the Canada border up in what is today Voyagers National Park. But everywhere else, wolves had uh, systematically been eradicated from their historical range. Human sentiment drives how we manage natural resources. And in the 1960s and 70s, people began to realize that we had greatly shortchanged our nation and future generations by removing uh, species from the landscape that had been native and uh, provided a vital role to functioning ecosystems. And so in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was created. 
wolves were listed as being regionally extinct from the contiguous United States in 1974. So just a year after the ESA, the Endangered Species Act was created, we were already recognizing that wolves had perhaps been eradic eradicated wrongly and they needed to be brought back into certain areas uh, where habitat was still viable for them. And this kicked off what became known as the Northern Rocky Mountains reintroduction. Now, you might be listening in today and thinking, I signed up for a webinar on the Colorado reintroduction, but bear with me, this is really important for us to understand how we got to the Colorado reintroduction uh, by first putting in chronological order what took place in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, again, I have a, a webinar that I've done for natural habitat specifically talking about the Northern Rocky Mountain reintroduction. Um, but I'm gonna go through this very quickly and I'm gonna make a complex story overly short. So please forgive me. And if you're interested, you can go back and watch those other webinars. Um, but there's a lot of uh, discussion and debate as to where we should reintroduce wolves to the contiguous United States. Uh, you noticed from my map, I'm sure, that wolves had a tremendous distribution across the northern, or excuse me, across all of the United States, essentially. Um, so why did we pick the northern Rocky Mountain states, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming? Um, well, it really boiled down to habitat. Uh, those Rocky Mountain states had a lot of elk and a lot of wild prey for wolves to subsist off of, whereas the environment, the landscape, and the habitat has changed radically in some of those other states where wolves historically once roamed. And so we have to put wolves back to an area where the habitat is still suitable. And so that is one of the reasons why we chose the Northern Rocky Mountains. And the reintroductions there took place in 1995 and in 1996. Uh, this is a picture of my supervisor, now retired, Doug Smith from Yellowstone National Park, literally carrying the wolves in on his shoulders. Um, but in 1995 and 1996, a total of 66 wolves were live captured in Canada and uh, from Alberta and then from British Columbia. 35 wolves were released into central Idaho and 31 wolves were released into Yellowstone National Park. And that was ultimately the reintroduction. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that while the discussion for uh, wolf reintroduction into the northern Rocky Mountains was happening, wolves were naturally recolonizing northwestern Montana, coming down across the Canada border all on their own. Um, this was great. Uh, the first uh, documented breeding pair that we had in northwestern Montana uh, whelped and had pups in 1986, so almost a decade before the actual reintroduction took place in central Idaho and into Yellowstone National Park. And this is important to realize because there was a lot of debate about whether or not the reintroduction should actually take place or whether we should just allow wolves to naturally move south and re-establish themselves in the rest of the Northern Rocky Mountains. Um, but for various reasons, ultimately it was decided that reintroduction should take place manually. Um, and from these reintroductions and from the natural recolonization, the wolf populations in the Northern Rockies have expanded into Washington and Oregon and have continued to grow and multiply. Then to add another layer of complexity to this story, the Mexican gray wolf, which is a subspecies, not a different species, but a subspecies of Canis lupus, uh, was reintroduced into Arizona and New Mexico in 1998. And this is done through a captive breeding program. And the wolf population there is still um, trying to become, or is becoming established and is, is still trying to take off. Um, I just had more hurdles than the Northern Rocky Mountain reintroduction program. Uh, but I don't have time to really get into the details of that today. Now, one of the reasons why wolves were decidedly reintroduced manually into the 1990s, uh, into the Northern Rockies in the 1990s, was because of some technicalities. Um, if you've been following the Colorado reintroduction, you may be aware of 
what is called the 10J rule of the Endangered Species Act. This is an amendment that was created to the Endangered Species Act in 1983, which basically allows the US Fish and Wildlife Service to reintroduce a non-essential experimental population onto the landscape. And this allows managers of wildlife to have a little bit more flexibility in how they manage animals. So as you can imagine, one of the big controversies about the reintroduction of wolves into Idaho and Yellowstone and Montana was that wolves kill livestock. And as a species completely protected by the Endangered Species Act, it is illegal to shoot a wolf at any time, even in defense of one's own property. Um, you can kill a wolf if it, is, if it is attacking a person, that is not against the law, but if a wolf were to be uh, seen attacking or killing livestock, the producer or the owner of the livestock could not legally shoot that wolf to protect their livestock. And this was very frustrating to a lot of producers back then, and it is today as well. And so one way to get around this logistical hurdle was to generate the 10J rule, which basically says we can take and reintroduce a population of animals that is deemed non-essential and experimental. And in doing so, we are allowing the public to protect their property by killing a wolf if caught in the act of attacking or killing livestock. I hope that I, I made that clear, but it's important to realize that this is only available in areas where wolves are not globally recognized as being an endangered species. Um, wolf populations in Canada and Alaska, as well as in parts of um, Siberia and Russia and China have been very abundant. So wolves have never been considered to be globally endangered, just regionally extinct or eradicated. And so by taking the initiative to manually bring wolves in, rather than allowing them to naturally recolonize, this allowed uh, wildlife managers to give ranchers and producers the tools needed and necessary to protect their livestock. Now I'll tell you from my own personal experience that there are almost never any accounts of producers catching wolves uh, in the act of killing or attacking their livestock. So the concern about ranchers or produce, producers shooting wolves that come and attack their livestock is not really, I would say, merited, but it does give a lot of peace of mind. And it's kind of a, a way that uh, technical legislators and uh, wildlife managers work to try and um, smooth over what is otherwise a, a rather sticky situation. It's, it makes people feel good by meeting them in the middle. Now, one of the questions I often get asked is, are wolves still endangered and protected by the Endangered Species Act today? Well, wolves were delisted and deemed recovered um, due to a 2011 congressional uh, directive in the Northern Rocky Mountain states. And this map here shows the area where wolves have been federally removed from the Endangered Species Act list and uh, termed recovered. Um, the populations are now viable and they no longer need federal protection in order for them to be recovered. Um, so you've got all of Montana and Idaho and parts of Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington or Northern Utah um, where the federal government no longer manages the species. Um, Wyoming was actually included in this in 2017, so much more recently. But this map shows where the federal government does not manage wolves. They are now managed at a state level. But outside of this, anywhere else in the lower 48 states, um, wolves are managed uh, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in conjunction with state agencies. Now this brings me to another important part of our discussion today is who manages wildlife in the United States. And according to the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, 
it is states that are responsible for managing and conserving wildlife. And so any state that you go to in the United States has its own government wildlife agency, which is responsible for conserving and managing the wildlife population. And when a species, any species, but in this case, the wolf is considered to be endangered or threatened of being imperiled, the federal government steps in and works with the states to help those populations recover. And once the population has been deemed recovered and is viable, then uh, authority for management reverts back to the state agency. So I hope that that is clear for everyone. And I know that there's a lot that we're going over today, but we're about to jump into how Colorado fits into all of this. Um, however, it is important to realize that again, Colorado uh, has its own management authority over wildlife within the state. Currently, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has management of wolves um, within the state of Colorado because they are not uh, recovered in that area yet. This is the map that I put together showing current estimates of wolf populations across the United States. You can see that uh, Alaska still is standing about 10,000 wolves, um, but we've gone from a reintroduction program of 66 wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountain states to having approximately 3,200 wolves. Uh, the wolf population in Minnesota, which was never wholly eradicated, has expounded and grown into the upper peninsula of Michigan, as well as Wisconsin, and they have about 4,000, 4,200 wolves-ish in that area. And then, of course, the Mexican gray wolf subspecies down in uh, Arizona and New Mexico, they're hovering around 180 wolves. I'm not going to be talking about the red wolf over in the Carolinas today. That is a separate species, actually, more closely related to the coyote. We can talk about that another day, but there you go. So wolf recovery from um, just even 50 years ago is looking pretty good. Um, even 30 years ago, we're doing uh, a lot better than where we were. Now, there are still a lot of places on the map where there is suitable habitat for wolves. And one of the obvious locations is the western slopes of Colorado where there's a lot of great habitat, wide open public lands, and one of the largest, if not the largest elk herd in the world um, residing in Colorado. And wolves depend on elk. They subsist off of elk um, wherever their ranges overlap. Um, so it was noticed pretty early on that, boy, here's some great suitable habitat for wolves, a species which once uh, were native to the state of Colorado. Um, why don't we begin working to uh, have connectivity between the northern Rocky Mountain states and the central Rockies? And this, of course, was first noticed by multiple conservationists, particularly a group out of Colorado known as the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project, um, began to pilot this idea and promote the idea of connectivity between wolves in the north and wolves in the south. And it just seems like a, a reasonable place for wolves to go next would be Colorado, again, where there's a lot of habitat and resources for them. And this gained a lot of momentum. Now, I have to pause for just a second and I have to explain something else, which is a little bit complex, but we're brave and we're smart. And so I have no doubt that you guys will be able to follow me here. But I mentioned in a previous slide that states manage wildlife and each state has a wildlife agency full of biologists and scientists working to monitor the population viability of multiple species within the state. Um, however, it's important for us to realize that um, it is ultimately the public and legislatures who have the ability to protect and conserve wildlife. Most commonly, if you look to the left on my screen here, what happens in all states is that the governor of the state appoints for a term representatives, which represent the public and multiple stakeholder groups. Um, 
Some might be conservationists and environmental groups. Some might be hunting and fishing groups. Some might be um, agricultural groups. Um, but these representatives are acting on behalf of the governor. And the state wildlife agency, in this case, Colorado, can step forward with their biologists and make population and wildlife and scientific recommendations to the appointed representatives. And then these appointed representatives ultimately decide what policies will be accepted and how wildlife will be managed. I hope that makes sense to everyone, but that is um, a democratic republic in action right there. So in any given state, you have people who are appointed by the governor that are ultimately acting on behalf of the public in theory that are going to uh, accept or deny recommendations made by the state wildlife agency. Conversely, on the right side of my screen, you can have top-down management where legislatures within the state who are elected by the public can bypass any recommendations that the state wildlife agency might have and they can create policies or laws which then the wildlife agency has to follow. Um, and in some cases this happens and it's frankly a little bit alarming as a government biologist it's frustrating when um, we get top-down directives that tell us how we're going to manage wildlife and, and often times there's no scientific input in that. Um, but in theory, again, it's the public that elected these legislatures and it's the public that ultimately decides how wildlife will be managed. Um, the wildlife agencies are kind of like the, the consultants and the advisors and the executors. They have to follow the laws that are given to them by the legislators. What happened in Colorado, however, was something different than this. Um, in November of 2020, multiple groups lobbied to include Proposition 114 um, into their election, which was to restore wolves back to Colorado. So this was a democratic process where the public in Colorado had the opportunity to vote for a simple majority as to whether or not wolves should or should not be reintroduced to the state. So in other wolf reintroduction programs, it's the federal government that has taken the initiative based off of the power given to them by the Endangered Species Act to restore wildlife species to landscapes where they've been eradicated. But this was the first time that a state actually took the initiative to restore a large carnivore. And so, again, in November of 2020, Proposition 114 went on the ballot and the public of Colorado got to vote whether or not they wanted to have wolves brought back to the state. Now, this is still an action that has generated a lot of discussion. And this is uh, some, some comments that I hear quite frequently I'm going to present to you right now as to how uh, all of this came to play. And some people did not like the idea of uh, the public voting on wolf reintroduction. Um, one of the most obvious reasons is because uh, this is a democratic process and the majority of people live in urban areas. And those urban areas are not the areas that are gonna be most intimately uh, engaging with wolves that are reintroduced on the landscape. And so some people thought and think still that it's not fair for people in rural communities to have to bear the burdens of wolf coexistence when they are actually the people who didn't want wolves reintroduced to begin with. Um, so this is one of the arguments made against the whole ballot initiative and uh, voting on reintroducing wolves to the landscape. Another argument that I hear a lot, especially from um, biologists or conservationists or environmentalists is that they don't support ballot box biology. Um, it's very uncomfortable, especially for people in the scientific community to have popular management usurp scientific management where people who are not formally trained as biologists voting on 
how a species should be managed or should be reintroduced. Or in theory, this opens up a can of worms saying that the public could vote to eradicate a species as well. Um, so people in the wildlife field are uncomfortable with this because again, it's usurping any scientific management or recommendations. It is a popular vote is what it boils down to. Um, and I think that this is a, a valid concern, but I also will bring up, if I go back a couple of slides, that uh, our current system and how things work also is uh, perhaps ineffective because we have legislatures and appointed representatives um, and the public voting for legislatures and governors um, who also have no formal background and training in natural resource management. Um, so again, it, the argument could be made that yes, ballot box biology is an uncomfortable idea, but it is perhaps already happening um, because again, ultimately legislatures can usurp the authority of state wildlife biologists and make decisions and policies into law. Nevertheless, either here nor there um, really matters, I guess, at the end of the day because the votes went in and the wolf reintroduction program uh, announced that they were victorious, that it had passed with a 50.91% majority. So they barely crossed that, that uh, simple majority line where wolves could be reintroduced into Colorado um, by not even quite uh, an entire percent. Well, after this vote came in, uh, the government agency in Colorado responsible for managing wildlife, known as Colorado Parks and Wildlife, they got together and they appointed uh, multiple stakeholders on this committee to generate a Colorado wolf re restoration and management plan. And this has been revised a few times over the last couple of years. And uh, the final management plan has come out um, just over a year ago. And you can go online and you can read more about the plan and the program as to what reintroduction is going to look like. But I will kind of um, cut to the chase and I'll give you the insider scoop and inform you as to what has happened and what is happening. And you can make your own uh, decisions as to whether it's good or whether it's bad or whether it uh, needs improvement or whether we need to have further discussions about how wolves will be managed in the state of Colorado. Um, but before I begin with that, I think that it's important for us to realize that one of the discussions about wolves coming back onto the Colorado landscape is this uh, rather exaggerated and optimistic and hopeful um, celebratory story that wolves are going to bring balance back to nature, that wolves are an apex predator which once was on the landscape and after being eradicated, nature has been, um, there's been uh, destabilization within the environment and we need wolves in order to bring uh, balance back to the natural system. Uh, this narrative comes mostly from the Yellowstone environment where I've spent time working and I've also given talks about this kind of iconic story which is often over character over caricaturized and over celebrated perhaps about how wolves can um, save ecosystems and how they can um, restore again this balance to the natural environment um, but the science is out and the science basically kind of refutes these noble and idyllic ideas um, we recognize from multiple studies all over the planet where wolves have been recolonizing and reintroduced that humans are the top dog and it's not the wolf that is ultimately the apex predator and multiple studies that have been conducted in europe and in asia and throughout north america we recognize that the ecological role of wolves is essentially diluted on human dominated landscapes and that it doesn't even have to be because of um, hunting pressure it's just a simple fact that humans are recognized by all wildlife species to be super predators and humans recreating on the landscape 
can greatly affect the otherwise natural behavior of elk and deer, as well as wolves and other animal species uh, on the landscape. So can we expect wolves to ultimately restore this kind of natural balance um, back to the their historical habitat and their historical range? Um, as a scientist, I have to say that it's highly unlikely is it a step in the right direction? I definitely believe it is. I believe that rewilding places that have lost um, species is a tremendous undertaking and it is something that we should do. Um, but I also think in caution that it's important for us to have realistic expectations as to what the outcomes will be. Um, climate change will not be fixed necessarily because we restore wolves to the landscape. Um, not only that, but we have a lot of habitat um, that has become fragmented over time. As more and more people pop up on the landscape, there's more competition for resources. And humans ultimately are, again, the top dog, and they will influence the dynamics of predators and their, with their prey, as well as with one another, and where they can and cannot live based off of human spatial use. So it's important for us to look at the predictable, suitable wolf habitat, not just through the ecological predictors, such as how many elk are on the landscape, and this will be a great place for wolves to live, but also take into consideration the social predictors, such as human land use and livestock land use. Um, it can be great, for example, if we have areas where wolves are protected from, say, hunting and trapping, but non-consumptive recreation in the outdoors can still be detrimental to wildlife populations. Even if your community isn't hunting wolves, uh, aggressive mountain biking and trail running and hiking and all of that kind of um, enjoyable human recreative uh, activity can disrupt the natural system as well and put stressors on predators as well as their prey. Um, so it's important to realize that suitable habitat is kind of a, an elusive term for us to try and define when we're looking at where wolves can be and where they can't be. Uh, this is an awesome map that was put together by Mark Dittmer, um, who was brought on. Uh, he's with the Forest Service, but he was brought on to do this study as to where it's possible for wolves to be in Colorado, which is the next question we often get asked. Where are wolves going to be put? Where are they going to live? Um, and this a uh, wonderful map that he put together kind of quantifies where ecological suitability is um, and also takes into consideration conflict risk. So in some places where there's perhaps a lot of elk and a lot of forests, we also have a lot of livestock and conflicts are going to be higher in those areas because of, again, human land use. Um, this map also takes into consideration that some groups of people don't want to have wolves on the landscape. Uh, Colorado borders um, some of the Ute reservations and the indigenous peoples in some of these areas, the tribal agencies, are not happy with wolf reintroduction because wolves are challenging to live with. And again, this kind of breaks down the stereotypical paradigms uh, of uh, which groups of people are happy to have wolves and want to coexist with them and which ones recognize that, hey, wolves are challenging and uh, we're not exactly sure if we're ready to have wolves back or not. Um, so these were kind of the areas that were most identified for wolves to come back to. And then there was coincidentally uh, the complication of the possible natural recolonization of wolves coming down from Wyoming into Colorado which took place during the ballot initiative, actually. So one of the other questions we get asked is, aren't there already wolves in Colorado? Why are we going to reintroduce wolves if wolves are in Colorado? Well, as I hopefully have clarified, wolves have not been in Colorado, but occasionally wolves do migrate down from the nearest uh, established population, which is in the Yellowstone ecosystem in Wyoming, and they tiptoe down south into Colorado. But very often these wolves are just lone dispersers, and so they do not represent a population, and it's unlikely that they will establish themselves because they're not likely to find a mate. However, 
there were six wolves, a pack of wolves that did come down from Wyoming in 2020, and they migrated into northwestern Colorado. And this became uh, exciting to a lot of people, and people asked, well, should we move forward with a reintroduction, yes or no? Um, but it goes back to the discussion that was made in the 1990s. Well, if we leave wolves up for natural recolonization, are we going to be able to apply for a 10J to empower local producers to protect their property if necessary? And if not, then folks are going to be perhaps less tolerant of wolves, was one of the arguments made. Another argument that I think is even more relevant and pragmatic is that a group of wolves, a pack of six wolves coming down into Colorado is highly unlikely to happen again. And so you're going to have ultimately this one pack fizzle out, which is essentially what has happened since 2020. Um, this is a map of Wyoming and where wolves currently are managed in northwestern Wyoming. Um, Wyoming uh, has an 85% section of the state which is termed a predator free zone where wolves can be shot on site and lethally removed without a hunting license or a permit now i'll point out for those of you who are unfamiliar with wyoming that most of wyoming is not suitable wolf habitat the country around yellowstone in that yellowstone ecosystem there in the northwestern corner is phenomenal wolf habitat and it includes yellowstone national park um, there, wolves are managed, and there is um, a hunting season, but it's a season and not a year-long round, um, round rally, you can shoot a wolf anytime you want kind of a season. Um, but wolves are managed according to state regulations and policies in that northwestern corner. Um, but the rest of the state is not great habitat, especially the part uh, connecting Wyoming to Colorado. There's a lot of... Um, less than ideal habitat for wolves and not only that but it's uh, logistically very difficult and almost impossible for multiple wolves over multiple years to connect this wyoming population with the colorado population so the fact that one group of wolves did it is pretty miraculous but in order for you to have a population you need another group of wolves to come down or at least uh, several individual wolves consecutively to come down in order to uh, replenish the genetic flow between the two populations. And I think realistically and logistically, um, that is very unlikely with the way the system is currently set up. We've got a few more slides. We're wrapping up at the end of the hour, but I think it's worthwhile for me to continue explaining um, this system and how it works. Uh, I am getting close to the end here, and I hope that we can have time for questions and answers um, even after I'm done, but bear with me. Uh, one of the other questions that is commonly asked is who is going to pay for a reintroduction? Um, you might not be aware of this, but state wildlife agencies are primarily funded through hunting and fishing license revenue and the sales of hunting and fishing licenses as well as uh, federal taxes, which are levied on firearms and ammunition, ammunition purchases. Um, so hunters bear a large chunk of the burden of wildlife conservation at a state level. The biologists and the scientists get their salaries from hunting and fishing licenses. And this is how the system was set up in the early 1900s, and it's how it's uh, maintained today. And these stakeholder groups, uh, might not, and in this case, often many do not value the wolf because they perceive the carnivore, the large apex carnivore, as another competitor for what they value on the landscape. And it's true that there is enough elk to go around, but while hunting is becoming less popular in some parts of the country, a place like Colorado, where they have so many elk, um, hunting is very competitive. And as the human population grows in Colorado, um, the ratio of hunters increases with the population growth. And there's only so many hunting permits that are allowed every year. And so hunters are not necessarily always a fan of restoring large carnivores because the restoration of a large carnivore is undoubtedly going to affect the population dynamics of deer and elk on the landscape. 
And so hunters and fishers were not excited to possibly be the ones who were going to be funding for the restoration. Um, so it was estimated that 1.1 to 2.2 million dollars every year is going to be needed for um, this Wolf Colorado program. And so the state set up a system where there is a general fund that dollars can come out of, as well as a conservation cash fund um, that can support this kind of management in order to um, remove the, the financial responsibility from stakeholders who are not voting for wolf reintroduction. Um, I think this is a good move, but as far as the sustainability of it goes, uh, we do have to ask ourselves up, who's going to be willing to pay for wildlife uh, in the future and further down the road. And um, wolves are expensive. Wolves are very expensive uh, to, to manage, to hire the biologists, to try and smooth over conflicts. Um, wolves are a costly species. And um, the sustainability of, of where this money is, is coming from is always brought into question among state and federal agencies. So hunting and fishing revenue is not where the money will be coming from, but rather general funds. Next, where are the wolves for the reintroduction coming from and where did they come from? Well, naturally, the Northern Rocky Mountain states have wolves that we would want to take and reintroduce into the state of Colorado. Um, but to really oversimplify, um, because of political differences, uh, the state of Wyoming and Montana and Idaho all said that they were not willing to take wolves from their state and reintroduce them into Colorado. Um, a lot of this came from lobbyists in the in the agricultural industries saying, hey, wolves are tough to live with. And they are, they really are. Um, and they said, we don't want to, we don't want to share our problems or push our problems onto folks in Colorado who um, are going to have to coexist with wolves and are going to be bearing the financial burdens of coexistence. And so um, they ultimately said that they were not willing to allow any wolves from their states to be re relocated into Colorado. Washington as well said no, but for slightly more complex reasons, which left the state of Oregon. And Oregon said, sure, you can have some of our wolves and we'll, we're willing to give you um, some of our wolves for the first year. Now, we just did our first phase of reintroduction. I'll talk about this in a second. But it's important to realize that in the next few years with wolf reintroduction, which will continue in Colorado, um, these other states, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and Washington, they will be revisited. And it's possible, if not likely, that these other states may change their mind. Um, I think uh, really it came down to, hey, we don't wanna be the one to pull the trigger. Um, but now that perhaps you have wolves in Colorado, we feel less bad if we just give you a few more, I guess. And in some cases, um, the state uh, wildlife representatives appointed by the governor needed to meet in order to get permission uh, to bring wolves back into Colorado. And the deadline just didn't jive with the reintroduction plan. Um, Colorado, however, was available and willing to help share some of their wolves. So with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, 10 wolves were captured towards the end of December and were relocated to Colorado. Um, the first reintroduction of five wolves took place on December 18th, 2023. Uh, these wolves were captured from packs primarily as yearlings or auxiliary adults, which means that they were of an age where it was time for them to leave the nest, to leave their natal packs, and they were gonna go off and find a mate soon anyway. So this was a comp compensatory removal from existing wolf packs and did not affect um, the population viability of the existing state in Colorado's wolf program. Um, so where do we go from here? And this is my last slide, so thanks for bearing with me. But Colorado reintroduced in 2023, 10 wolves from the state of Oregon. And that's as many as Oregon would agree to uh, transfer over to Colorado. And the program's outline 
dictates that 10 to 15 wolves will be in, reintroduced into Colorado for the first three to five years uh, until the population is uh, deemed uh, stable and viable. So again, next year at the end of 2024, we will see another uh, push of transitory reintroduction where wolves are captured and collared from certain states and brought into Colorado. And again, this will take place now for the next two to four years. Um, there will be four phases in this recovery process. And the state of Colorado does not have a population objective. That's another question we get asked is how many wolves does Colorado plan to have? Um, there's no population objective. However, aside from federal endangered species listing, every state has its own endangered or imperiled species list. And the state of Colorado has acknowledged that once its wolf population reaches 200 wolves or 150 wolves for two consecutive years, that the state will remove the wolf from its state endangered list. Um, and then it will revisit how wolves will be managed in the state of Colorado at that time. Um, but to go beyond that is speculation. Uh, needless to say, it's been a wild and fun ride. So here we are again, we've uh, transferred wolves. Um, now what's gonna happen next is we're gonna monitor the wolves and uh, reevaluate the, the state's management plan, the CPW and the committees put together uh, to reintroduce wolves are all excited and a part of that. This is a tremendous and historical event. And uh, my friend, Matt Barnes, who is on the committee supervising and helping to um, uh, smooth over the process of reintroduction, working as a rangeland scientist, trying to mitigate conflicts with producers and ranchers. I think that he kind of summarizes it all by saying that uh, we can we can do this. There's a lot of conflicts ahead of us. There's a lot of drama ahead of us. Wolves generate hysteria. Um, nevertheless, this is a, a remarkable experience and the West will be a wilder place because of it. So with that, I thank you very much for listening to me to the top of the hour. Um, and I have time for taking questions and doing answers if NetHab has time for it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Before we do start in with some questions and answers, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So let's get right to some of these questions. You did a great job of tackling many of them. So thank you for that. So um, where are they reintroduced into like a fenced in area or were they just turned loose when they were brought to Colorado? That's a good question. So biologists refer to um, this as a hard release or a soft release. In Yellowstone, when wolves were brought in in 1995, they were held in one acre pens for the first two months after relocation. And this was a soft release to help them become habituated to their new environment before the pens were opened and wolves were released. In Idaho, and then in 1996 in Yellowstone, they did a hard release where they just opened the boxes and wolves ran off into the woods. Um, they found from the Northern Rocky Mountain Reintroduction Program that the hard release actually worked just as well and in some ways better than the soft release. So in Colorado, this was a hard release. They opened up the boxes and the wolves took off into the woods. Every wolf that has been relocated, I should have mentioned this, is wearing a GPS collar and has been vaccinated as well um, to prevent the transmission of any um, possible diseases to the, the populations of other canids within the state of Colorado. Great, thank you. Now, is December the ideal time for capturing and reintroduction? Was the winter time targeted for a specific reason? Well, it's that's a complex uh, question. So there was a policy in Colorado that dictated um, that Colorado Parks and Wildlife had to have wolves on the ground before the end of the calendar year, before December 31st. And biologically, that is an arbitrary and 
a challenging and perhaps not the best deadline to have wolves relocated. Um, and it's just because of logistical reasons. Uh, it's easier to and safer to capture wolves when there's snow on the ground and you're darting from helicopters. Um, it's just, it's safer for the, the crews as well as the animals. It's just logistically a bit easier. And this year we've had a late winter. And so it was challenging and stressful to meet that deadline. Um, however, winter relocation and translocation is, I think, an ideal time to do this. Um, December 31st is an arbitrary deadline. I think it, it should have perhaps been by the end of the winter, which might have been, you know, been March or even before the breeding season. I guess before the breeding season would have been best. So if you could have had a deadline before uh, February 1st, I think that would have been a little bit better for everyone. Thank you. So uh, were biologists in Colorado supportive of the reintroduction of wolves in Colorado? Great question. And I think uh, CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, they have a really honorable, if you will, statement on their website, which talks about wolves and says, in a nutshell, hey, it, it doesn't matter what our opinion is because we are the wildlife agency which governs and manages wildlife in accordance with what the public desire. And I mean, I'm a government biologist and I know that's maybe kind of a cop out of an answer, but um, if the people voted on it, then yes, the, the agency is willing to help reintroduce wolves. I think that Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, biologists recognize that wolves would eventually be back in Colorado. You know, when wolves start coming down from Wyoming, who knows? It, it could have been never, but it might have been just a couple of years before wolves began to establish themselves in the state of Colorado. And uh, so those discussions had already been happening. Biologists are biologists. We love animals. Wolves are extremely challenging in the social sphere. A lot of people attack biologists, and I know and don't blame any biologists who perhaps we're not excited to have wolves come back because life is gonna be more challenging for those biologists now. So how quickly do you expect the national park to be uh, repopulated? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know, that would all be speculation. I would give it a couple of years, but it could be a lot sooner. Um, again, 10 wolves were reintroduced this last winter and I don't know if I don't know. We'll see what happens when wolves start to whelp this spring. We'll see where their dens are at. Can you predict what may happen to coyotes now that wolves are being reintroduced? Yeah, in areas where wolves and coyotes overlap, coyotes are the smaller dog and they're often um, oppressed by wolves and wolves kill coyotes, but they don't eat them. Um, this will probably affect coyote behavior, uh, and I, I suspect that in small areas, the coyote population will see ebbs and flows, and it will kind of um, learn to adapt with having a dangerous apex predator on the landscape. Is there talk about reintroducing wolves anywhere else, such as upstate New York, for instance? No, people ask me a lot about upstate New York and Maine, um, but I don't, most wolf biologists don't foresee anything like that happening anytime soon. And I think for biological reasons, yes, you do have wild spaces, but also you do have, um, again, more anthropogenic influence in those areas than some people even realize, which would make it difficult for wolves to establish themselves. Um, but things can change and again like Colorado voted as a state to reintroduce wolves that was a wild card so there are other wild cards at play and, and who knows so can you explain the difference between a subspecies and what a different species is there is some confusion yeah absolutely so a subspecies and in this case with wolves, uh, I'm even gonna 
generalize a little bit more and say that wolves are pretty much one species. So humans, for example, no matter where you're from on the planet, you belong to the genus in the species designation Homo sapien. Um, so you are the same animal, the same species, um, whether you're from Australia, Africa, Europe, Asia, or North America, Central America, South America. We are all one species and we can all inbreed, we all have, or interbreed, excuse me. Um, in this case with wolves, a subspecies is more like an ecotype where you have a local population which has adapted to its environmental circumstances. And the population has been there long enough that it might have some physical traits which are slightly different from other populations. So the Mexican gray wolf subspecies uh, lives in the desert and it's lived in the desert for so long that its body size is a little bit smaller. It doesn't get the big heavy winter coats because it's out in the desert most of the time. It's living off of a different prey base in some areas. And so physically it starts to look a little bit differently and genetically it starts to get a little bit different as well. But it's so subtle that you could take a Mexican wolf and drop it off in Alaska and it would find other wolves and breed with it and be successful. I have no doubt of that. But it would look perhaps a little bit different. Um, so it's just a, you start to split hairs. It's more of uh, minute details as you get into subspecies. Thank you so much for addressing that, Aaron. Unfortunately, that will be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to throw it back to you for some closing comments. Thanks everyone and thanks for your questions. I hope that I did a decent job in presenting the information to you today that I thought was most pertinent and, and uh, important for everyone to have a firm grasp of. Um, this is, going to get a lot of attention in the next few years. It's not just a, a one and done sort of thing. Um, Colorado now has wolves back on the landscape. Wolves will undoubtedly um, repopulate other areas and states like Utah, um, which is adjacent to where wolves are being reintroduced into Colorado. And, and it'll be interesting. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, wolves are a fascinating creature, and I've dedicated my life to them. And I acknowledge that they are also challenging to live with, um, even as a, a wolf advocate. Wolves can be stressful and difficult for people who have to live with them every day. And um, I hope that we can have positive relationship building experiences and we can help the communities that are um, going to be living with wolves in Colorado now. And we can try and promote uh, a proactive form of coexistence. And I'm very excited to see where the future will take us. So thanks again for tuning in. Thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today, Aaron. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHap, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathap.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.